So one uh, lunch time we were with the kids and we were explaining to them what the Underground Railroad was and how the slaves were escaping from the South and they would travel at night from the safe house to safe house and they would follow the Big Dipper up in the sky and the North Star was the tail of the Big Dipper and it would always point north so they knew which way to go and they never saw the Big Dipper before. They didn't know what we were talking about. So not even realizing, I said, yeah, just go out at night and the big, you can see the Big Dipper in the sky at night. Just go in your backyard. And without even realizing, they all started laughing at Darby and I and said, are you kidding? We could never go in our backyard. It's too dangerous at night. And Darby and I just looked at each other and just had this aha moment of this cultural bias of, wow, we're, sending, we're telling these girls to go out in their backyard where it would be totally safe in our neighborhood. So in the beginning, uh, we called it the Emancipated Teacher Project, and the teacher being emancipated was me. But over time, we realized it was impacting our entire school culture, the work that I was doing with kids, and so we decided to rename it as the Emancipated School Project. The idea of the Emancipated School Project came from, really from my listening to administrators, teachers, and kids over the last decade or so, I would say. And coming to this idea that there was a triangle of tensions going on in the classroom that really needed to be addressed. This triangle describes the increasingly tricky relationship between what I see as three sets of very culturally distinct classroom stakeholders. You've got educators, right, who are still predominantly white, female, and middle class. But now we have a now majority of black and brown students and their families, many of more who are living in poverty. And then you have our policymakers making decisions far away from the reality of the classroom, but who have to address the demands of their constituents. As we educators have become increasingly worried about job security, we've had to turn most of our time, energy, and attention towards mandates that shape our instructional behaviors, leaving really little no room to address and manage that growing disconnect between our worldviews as educators and those of our students. This is just crazy to me because it's critical for students and teachers in 21st century classrooms to be able to get to know each other, learn about one another's cultures, and build relationships in order to cultivate the kind of academic rigor we're looking for in the classroom. And honestly, it's been really hard to do that kind of deep work over the last decade, at least where I live. The Emancipated School Project is designed to be a three-year conversation framed by ongoing cycles of collective inquiry and led by a school's most chronically disciplined students. The project involved two kinds of teams who met weekly at lunch or before school, student teams and educator teams. Each team discussed readings, reflected on dilemmas and questions, and captured and analyzed data to gain insights into those questions. Our student teams also use their meetings to plan and prepare experiences to support educator learning. So every week we met at least once in Dr. D's class and it was always a different topic. There was never any day that was the same. Once a month, students facilitated these experiences for just their administrators in year one and then just for their teachers in year two. Um, I think it's defiance and classroom disruption. I remember Dr. D coming to me with a proposal for an inquiry, a teacher inquiry project she wanted to do um, to help us as a team, I know we were talking about the most chronically disciplined students and what we could do to 
keep them in class, support teachers, improve the school climate. And um, that conversation had been a faculty-wide conversation. It was interesting for me to have the opportunity to tell you kind of why grown-ups do the things we do. And I knew Dr. D took it a step further and really talked about the pressures of the classroom teacher and what they're feeling in terms of the material they have to cover or the accountability of, a, of an exam or an end of course exam or something like that. And then to have you guys have the opportunity as the experts on kids and kid behaviors to kind of tell us what you come to school with, you know, what's on your minds, what right. you hear and see when you see us doing our thing. I thought that was a really interesting opportunity to have that perspective. I don't know she thinks. What, no. what is she thinking? She was like, oh, she, <laughs> she got kids. dress cold. Oh, uh -huh. oh she need to get, he, he need to get class. Uh -huh. She looks back. Always worry about somebody else, man. I know what she be thinking. What does she think? They like they be all uh, stereotyping us. Oh like God. they say they don't, but they really do. I think I learned patience through the process too, because I can remember coming a couple times and being very frustrated, leaving, thinking, because I would hear um, the students' perspective on things, and I would just, for example, like Dean Bell doesn't like us; he's just out there to get us in trouble. And I would, you know, so want to correct and say, no, it's really, you know, but. <laughs> Through this process, I think it was the students had to come to that discovery on their own. You couldn't force feed those things to them, but sometimes I would leave feeling frustrated, like, gosh, if they could only see, um, you know, see that from our side. But I, I think that was a healthy process for the students to go through. But after, like, like you said, the whole relationship thing, after we actually got to talk to you, after we actually got to understand what y'all was coming from, it was different. Like, it's just like, okay, well, yeah, I do understand why I was wrong. Yeah, I should have actually talked to you. But now that we actually have a relationship, it would be easier to talk to you. So that's what made the interviews more exciting because now it's not just, oh, administrators and students. Now it's more on a friendship level. So it was easier to talk to y'all. It was more fun to interview you. For me, it lived in in the relationship and us understanding the stuff we all bring. And I think I thought I had a pretty healthy appreciation for kids bringing stuff to school, but grown-ups bring a lot of stuff. For year two, it was really important that we include the teachers. Darby sat me down and explained the whole Emancipation Project. I thought it was a great adventure to go into in delving into putting teachers together with students and she had done a lot of work the year previously with working with students and really getting them on board and definitely the school itself had seen a decrease in referrals and saw kids kind of really starting to talk to teachers more and starting to see that kind of culminate into a bigger project and what I suggested was why not bring the teachers in since they're an important part of all of this. Our morning PLCs were before school and we would usually be given um, a pretty tough topic and then we would think about it, write about it possibly, and then discuss it and really come from uh, each of our own perspectives on a specific topic. And sometimes it was emotional, sometimes it was heated, but I think we all left we left with a feeling of like we've gotten somewhere, kind of like a rapid, like we were on a river and we just went through a really tough rapid, section of rapids, and now we were at a smooth part. So one time we had a panel discussion and what we did there is that we talked about why we do this stuff, how we do it, and then the teachers would ask us questions about why, why we would do it that way, and then we would ask them questions back and answer the questions. Was it hard? Sometimes. The project was never meant to be an intervention. We never believed kids or teachers were in some kind of need of being fixed. What we needed was just the right conditions to be able to work together. And so we were really surprised when our deans, uh, Dean Bell and, and Dean Hall were looking at our disciplinary data over time, and they started noticing a lot of changes. Over the two-year pilot, referrals dropped from 655 down to 473, and out-of-school suspensions followed the same pattern, 
even though our school population remained stable and our free and reduced lunch population actually went up. I bettered myself from seventh grade and sixth grade because all I had was referrals almost like every week. And now I only had three referrals this year. It, it helped me improve my attitude a lot. <laughs> I don't think I changed a lot. I think that the characteristics that I had changed a lot, not my personality, just the character. Oh, so like you're the same person on the inside, but you're showing it in different ways now. Yeah. The whole group itself, like it, it did, it changed a lot. The drops in our exclusionary discipline practices were really cool to see. But as we look closer, we really saw them more as a side effect to the kinds of work we were doing. Um, we wanted uh, the Emancipated School Project to tell the deeper story of what was going on at our school and why we saw so many changes. You know, I think campus became a lot calmer and uh, the students were misbehaving less, but teachers were also seeing a different perspective and instead of being quick to write a referral for something that they might have written up a referral for in a previous year, um, they would take the time, come to the office, talk with the deans, Dean Hall and Dean Bell were always so open to having those conversations and try to attack it from a different angle and be more creative in how um, the issues could be addressed and, and be more proactive instead of reactive. They learned to know, to see things from different perspectives, like from the student's perspective. Relationships are so important. Everything like you're talking about, it, it's not about referrals. When you build relationships, they'll last and kids will come tell you things that are going on on campus. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you things that are going on in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and it, it, it's just, it, it helps them because they feel like they're a part of the decision making that we're doing also. Many times the students that I'm interacting with understand that they, they went wrong or that, that, they, um, that they deserve some type of consequence, but when they feel like their story isn't getting told and that they don't, they're not understood, um, then they get extremely upset. And that's where you start to see um, I think many times suspensions come out of a situation that really could have been a, a student conference, um, and, but it's, the student has to have their story told. They have to be able to feel like um, that they're understood and heard. They, that doesn't mean that they're right, um, but it means that they're heard. Ultimately, with this project, it allowed the students to kind of see, hey, teachers are human too. Students and teachers got to see the other side, and that marriage kind of blended together to allow even more to come out of it. To me, it was such a specific thing. It's like when you think about in the courtyard between classes and mm -hmm. like in the beginning when you guys said, oh, you guys just come out and yell at us or right. get us in That's trouble. Say, keep moving. Right, right. So to walk up to just a big group of students and think, oh my gosh, how does one make 57 go to class on time, <laughs> right? But it wasn't that anymore because all I had to do was catch your eye and go, Bree, really? It's time for math. And you were like, you're right. Everybody, come on, because yeah. you're a leader, you. and I'm a leader, and I felt like we worked together on what we needed to do, and I was pretty big. Correct. <laughs> One thing that's really impacted me is recognizing that it's not personal, that my student has adult problems. And a lot of times what I think teachers kind of identify or mm -hmm. kind of say is defiance. Mm -hmm. Is that really being defiant, or is it a student who has been exposed to trauma and is stuck going to what instinctually they want to do, which is to be defensive. I saw light bulbs go mm -hmm. off with faculty when we were talking about, you know, instead of asking a kid, what's wrong with you, right. saying, what has happened to you? There is that common ground. Um, I've had trauma in my life and all of a sudden I realize there are times, wow, I shut down, I get defensive. And someone may think, wow, you're really not a very caring person, but I know it's kind of my defenses going up because that's that's gone under my survival level there. As educators, we're still privileged. We may have overcome huge obstacles to be where we are, but if we're receiving a paycheck, if we're receiving benefits, if I have a roof over my head or I'm able to get here every day, I'm still in a place of privilege that a lot of my students are not in. Um, I think any time that we can make an effort to connect with culture that is different from ours, I benefit from it. And I really, um, 
I, I found it impacted me personally with my coworkers as well, uh, especially sitting with people that I don't get a chance to talk to on a regular basis, people who I might have assumptions about what they think about um, the different cultures at our school. Being able to be in the room with all of them and sort of discuss and argue and bring up points of view that are different um, expands me as a person, as a teacher, you know, helps me a lot. And also, you know, interacting with the students as well and hearing their point of view, uh, even hearing their their perspective when it feels unfair is really important to know that sometimes, you know, those emotions, whether you disagree with them or not, are real and they're in your classroom and they need to be heard. And so that, that really helped me a lot, not just as a teacher, as a person too. I was forced to be introspective and I was forced to look inward and ask the hard questions. I had to ask the questions that no one's ever made me ask before. What is my value in this profession? I really think this is important. I've grown a lot through um, working with other teachers because there were blocks that I've seen in other people that I couldn't understand and I made judgments on them for that and through this process it really opened me up as well to other perspectives that I kind of wasn't willing to listen to because I was judging them for having them. And so I really found that through the process, um, we all grew and we're continuing to grow. And it seems like we, it's almost like we couldn't go back at this point. So an emancipated school, emancipated teacher can just kind of look at students as students and kind of let them show, show, let them show the teacher who they are, you know, not just already assuming something about them. We become aware of social issues that our students are dealing with. A student's really like having a connection with the teachers. To get your students to the best possible person who they can be. A school where it's not us versus them, it's us and we're all together and we're honest, we're fallible at times, and sometimes we have greatness. What is Ms. Wise thinking about every day when she's looking at kids in the morning? What do you think's in her head? And you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Well, before I was um, like now, I thought that um, like pretzels and stuff just wanted to get us in trouble and stuff. Just like looking for you to do something wrong? Not really. Actually, I love when nothing's going wrong. That's my favorite day in the whole world. Why is that? because that means everybody's like having a good day and doing what they're supposed to do and they're safe and they're not giving each other a hard time and the teachers are getting along with the kids. I love that day.